Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod, and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello, and welcome to episode 80 of the Monday Night Review. I hope you're well. I'm sorry we're a day late today, but I was taking my friends to the airport yesterday morning. I had to leave at 3 a.m., and I was knackered, so I gave myself the day off. So we're having the Tuesday night review instead, and today we're going to talk about the life and death of Harry Houdini. Felt like we needed a bit of a palate cleanser, because no doubt there's going to be some horrible murder coming up soon. And Harry Houdini is definitely someone who's, I mean, still a household name. His fame doesn't seem to diminish over time. He's still pretty much the undisputed king of illusion and escape artistry. But his early death, though fairly well documented, does have an air of mystery about it. Harry Houdini was born Eric Weiss in Budapest, Hungary, on the 24th of March, 1874, to Jewish parents, Rabbi Mayor Samuel Weiss and Cecilia Steiner. I'm going to call him Houdini throughout, but we'll get round to his name change eventually. He was one of seven children. And like many, the Weiss family decided to go and live the dream uh, in America. And so Houdini and his family travelled to the land of the free in July 1878 at the age of four with his pregnant mother and four brothers on a boat journey that would have taken them about six weeks. And... When they arrived, the family changed their name to the German spelling Weiss. Eric, E-R-I-K, became E-H-R-I-C-H, Erich, shortened, shortened to Eri, and eventually Harry. The family first lived in Appleton, Wisconsin, where his father served as a rabbi of the Zion Reform Jewish congregation. And in the 1880 census, the family were listed as living on Appleton Street, which is now known as Houdini Plaza. In 1882, Rabbi Weiss officially became an American citizen, but he also lost his job and was diagnosed with cancer, and the family moved to Milwaukee, where they lived in complete poverty. Houdini knew that he would need to provide for his beloved mother, and support his siblings. So despite being incredibly bright, he leaves school at eight to shine shoes and sell newspapers. At nine, he started performing as a trapeze artist at the circus, called calling himself the Prince of the Air. And at 12, he leaves home with his father to go to the centre of New York to find work. They lived in a boarding house in East 79th Street and Houdini was immediately drawn to Coney Island, which at the time was the largest amusement area in the whole of the United States and a place where people who were drawn to performing, who were perhaps for whatever reason on the fringes of society would go and Here he continued his trapeze work, but also learnt the important tricks of the trade that he would use throughout his career. How to relax his throat muscles, to be able to produce 50 threaded needles from his mouth, and to eventually hide keys to help his escapes. And he watched what it took to become a performer. He knew that his physical stature, five foot five and slight, was not going to cut it and eventually it would be talked about a lot in the media Um, but he worked on this he studied the strong men and those performers who had complete control of their body and mind he never drank or smoked he would run five miles a day in Central Park every day and though it was often commented that he was slight and that he was small his personality and his smile and his twinkling eyes were always commented on he was very magnetic to watch and he was incredibly strong 
There are also some that say that he was bow-legged and this would help with his escape, though I've only seen that in a couple of places. So at the age of 17, he decided to change his surname to Houdini. He wanted to honour his idol, Robert Houdin, and was told that if you add an I onto a name in French, it means like. This isn't true, but Houdini he became, and it's a name that stands out. There is only one Harry Houdini. There is only one Houdini, and he begins his magic career, appearing in an act with strongman Emile Jarro, performing at sideshows as the wild man. He performs at Coney Island with his brother Theodore, who professionally gets called Dash Hardeen, and they perform together as the brothers Houdini. Now, Dash too has a na- natural flair for magic and showmanship, and he learns a lot from his brother and was a great support to his brother. It, it There doesn't seem to have been acrimonious competition between the two of them. It is Houdini's fierce drive and extreme pushing of the limits that just puts him at the forefront of illusion and escapology. And Dash doesn't seem to want to overtake his brother. He's happy to be a performer, but not compete for the limelight. Dash and Harry Houdini are described as brilliant raconteurs and their desire to better and further the art of magic and illusion make them popular in magic and showman circles, not just with the public. And Dash would go on to fa- to, to be the founder of the Magicians Guild of America, of which he was president until his death in 1945. Now, while performing with his brother, 21-year-old Houdini meets Wilhelmina Beatrice Rayner, known as Bess, and he marries her three weeks later. He would later say about her, she was the one shackle I never want to escape from. As the Houdinis, she becomes his stage assistant and supports him throughout his career. She is always there for him. He trusts her completely, as you would have to with some of the tricks that he does. And his ascent to stardom is incredibly tough. There's a lot of hard work. He nearly gives up. He feels frustrated. but he doesn't give up. He initially mostly focused on the traditional card tricks and he built himself as the king of cards. But the thing is, when it came to card tricks, he was average at best. His sleight of hand left a lot to be desired. But one of the things that was so noticeable about Houdini is his obsessive work ethic and his ability as a showman. He wanted to break away from traditional magic and circus shows and though may not have he wasn't very good at card tricks but when he moved to escapology he mastered the art of illusion and if anything was an even better at entertainment and self-promotion than he was at the illusions when he realized his escapology would bring in the crowds he went for it constantly striving for bigger for a bigger and better show and it's basically believed that he became one of the first celebrities in America. In the spring of 1899 Harry Houdini met Martin Beck whilst performing in a beer hall in St Paul Minnesota. Beck who had come to America also from a Jewish family from the kingdom of Hungary which is now in Slovakia had arrived, worked his way up from a waiter in a beer garden in Illinois to becoming a theatre owner and manager in New York's theatre district. And he saw in Houdini the star quality that would later he would become known for and sent him a telegram to his next show in Chicago. The telegram read, You can open Omaha March 26th, $60. We'll see act probably make you proposition for for all next season. And according to Houdini's wife, this represented his big break in his professional career as a performer. 
And Houdini wrote at the bottom of the telegram, which he kept for the rest of his life and best kept for the rest of her life. This wire changed my whole life's journey. Beck and Houdini became close friends as well as artist and booking manager. And Beck advised Houdini to concentrate on his escape act and booked him on the Orpheum vaudeville circuit. Within months, Houdini was performing at the top vaudeville houses all over the US, and in 1900, Beck arranged for him to tour Europe. He went on tour as the handcuff king, challenging local policemen to handcuff and imprison him, and he would always manage to escape. He word spread and his shows sold out. And when he is wherever he went, people knew who he was until he got to London. When he arrived in London, he was completely unheard of. Now, after some days of unsuccessful interviews in London, Houdini's British agent, Harry Day, helped him get an interview with the manager of the Alhambra Theatre. Houdini, ever the showman, walked into Scotland Yard and gave a successful demonstration of his escape from handcuffs and his success in baffling the police so effectively saw him booked at the Alhambra for six months. His show was an immediate hit and his salary rose to $300 a week, which is about $9,772 in today's money. In 1904, the Daily Mirror challenged Houdini to escape from handcuffs that had allegedly taken five years to make. He, of course, accepted, and the challenge was set for the 17th of March at the Hippodrome. 4,000 people and more than 100 journalists were in the audience, and Houdini comes onto the stage. They see him get put into the cuffs, and then he would go into a ghost house basically a small screen so that he would then struggle with the handcuffs. I think what's really interesting is that Houdini never says that he uses anything supernatural to escape. It's a struggle for him to escape. He does it in many different ways, which I think is really interesting. And after 25 minutes, he comes out and he's he says his, his coat is restricting his movements. Can he take have the handcuffs taken off so that he can take off his coat and the representative from the daily mirror says no because he thinks houdini just wants to look at how the handcuffs are undone and so houdini takes out his pen knife with his teeth and cuts up the sleeves on his coat to give him more movement and then he goes back behind the curtain for another hour to try and get out of the handcuffs now the band is constantly playing waltz. Houdini is having a really hard time of it. And one version of events have it that Bess comes onto the stage and gives him a kiss. And some believe that this was a way of her passing the key to him. However, eyewitnesses deny that she, this kiss ever happened. They said she didn't appear on the stage at all. And the key itself was six inches long. So this couldn't have happened however I would like to point out that they were both performers she she was a performer when they met he she was his assistant and he trained her and we know that he had learned how to relax the muscles in his throat so for, if from someone who's learned how to do sword swallowing a six inch key is probably not much of a problem but as we know she didn't go on the stage at all so the crowd waited, the band played, and after an hour and seven minutes, he appears cuffless and was paraded on the shoulders of the cheering crowd. He actually broke down and wept later, saying it was one of the most difficult escapes of his career. And he just becomes the biggest star and one of the highest paid entertainers in the world. So he tours Europe and Russia. In each city, he challenges the local police to restrain him with shackles, lock him in their jails. In many of these challenge escapes, he's stripped nude and searched first. And in Moscow, he escapes from a Siberian prison transport van, claiming that had he been unable to free himself, he would have had to travel to Siberia, where the only key was kept. 
In Cologne, he sued a police officer who said he made his escape using bribery. Houdini won the case when he was able to break into the judge's safe, although he would later say that the judge had actually forgotten to lock it. When he returns to America in 1904, he buys a brownstone in Harlem at 27 at 278 West 113th Street and he would live there with Bess and various members of his family until his death. It's obviously now got a plaque on it. From 1907 and throughout the 1910s Houdini performed across the United States. He freed himself from jails, handcuffs, chains, ropes and straitjackets often whilst hanging from a rope in sight of street audiences. He rarely charged people, unless, of course, he was in a venue. He would just appear somewhere and perform for a wide audience. And he was slightly obsessive about people not copying him. He, Because of imitators, Houdini put his handcuff act behind him. And on the 25th of January 1908, he introduced his own original act, The Milk Can Escape. In this act, he would be handcuffed and sealed inside an oversized milk can, which was filled with water. And then he would make his escape again behind a curtain. What's interesting is his brother Dash would realise that um, people liked seeing the escape in front of them and it took a while for Houdini to start doing that. As part of the effect Houdini invited members of the audience to hold their breath along with him while he was inside the can. The dramatic poster stated failure means a drowning death and they're not wrong. It's not just water inhalation that you have to worry about. If you hold your breath for too long underwater the build-up of CO2 in your system will cause you to pass out. You're basically making your brain shut itself down requires incredible physical, mental and emotional strength and indeed each act was a remarkable feat of endurance and he would perform it day after day after day. The escape proved to be a sensation. Houdini soon modified the escape to include the milk can being locked inside a wooden chest, being chained or padlocked and he performs this escape as a regular part of his act Only for four years, though it would remain one of the acts most associated with him and Dash would continue to perform the milk can escape well into the 1940s, but his hatred of imitators, the fact that they would start doing the milk can escape made him think he needed to try something more. The possibility of failure and death thrilled his audiences And so he expanded his repertoire with his Escape Challenge Act, in which he invited the public to devise contraptions to hold him. These included nailed packing crates, sometimes these would be lowered into water, riveted boilers, wet sheets, mailbags, and even the belly of a whale that had washed ashore in Boston. Brewers in Pennsylvania and other cities challenged Houdini to escape from a barrel after they'd filled it with beer. Most of the time he would perform semi-naked, but would hide picks and keys about his person, sometimes in his hair, sometimes in his mouth. And many believed that if his wife kissed him on stage, she would be passing a key to him that way. Sometimes he would have a metal plate on his knee, which some cuffs could be broken into with. If you thump them onto the metal plate, it would be enough to loosen them. He also had a slim steel magnetic strip that he could attach a key to the end of to make it long enough for him to uncuff himself. Cuffs would usually have the rigid um, bit of metal in the middle, not the chain link, meaning that if the key had to be inserted in the middle of the cuffs, it was impossible to do it with your own hands or your teeth. Whereas if he used the long, thin magnetic strip, that would work. Obviously, though, if you see him jumping handcuffed into a river, he literally pops up and his cuffs are off, so he's not faffing around um, with a key then. He was also able to use his body in a way to enable his escape, flexing his bones and muscles 
when being put into cuffs or a straitjacket, so that then when he relaxed, there was more room for him to move. His need to support his family was now met. He had money and celebrity and even presented his mother with a dress allegedly made for Queen Victoria, but he still wanted more. He never takes his foot off the accelerator pedal. He's incredibly ambitious, um, but also very passionate about expo- exposing fraudulent mediums and mystics. He wants to promote the true side of magic, the artistry and the performance. And I guess the the physical and mental endeavours it takes to perform and copycats are springing up everywhere and it annoys him he says do others or they will do you that was one of his mottos and he would often issue public challenges to those who would would copy him and it is these copycats that made him retire the milk can act and replace it with the chinese water torture cell on the 21st of September 1905 in Battery Park, Manhattan, Houdini had challenged young whippersnapper Bondini to come and meet him. They were to jump into the freezing Hudson River in shackles to see who could escape first. After 1 minute 35 seconds, Houdini appears hands free from the shackles and climbs out himself. Bondini, however, nearly dies. There's a huge crowd. This was one of the first attempts at a life and death public spectacle and it was a new thing for Houdini and it's from this that he becomes obsessed with underwater escapes and Houdini's most notorious act was yet to come in Berlin on the 21st of September 1912 he introduced the Chinese water torture cell this would involve him having his feet fixed in a wooden block upside down he would be lowered into a glass and steel cell which is basically like a phone box and this would be filled to overflowing with water and he would then have to escape when upside down you're not only dealing with the pain there's your full body weight hanging on your feet but pressure on your head and your body from being upside down is immense but also the pressure then added by the water it makes it difficult for you to think straight your body is discombobulated from being upside down but also it's noting notable that it is incredibly hard to fill your lungs properly upside down which is how he would get his last breath before being lowered into the water a red curtain would be pulled around and then the audience would wait for him to escape which he did night after night it's sometimes easy to think that once he'd achieved stardom and nailed his axe that Houdini had it pretty easy but injuries did happen and the training he undertook was intense in New York he gashed his head on the riverbed When jumping into the Mississippi, the current was so strong he nearly drowned. Once when performing the upside-down straitjacket escape, high winds crashed him into the side of a building. For training, he would lie in baths of freezing cold water and hold his breath for as long as possible. He would practice and practice and practice. His record for holding his breath was 3 minutes and 45 seconds. He would perform out in public wherever he had the opportunity often getting put in straight jacket and dangling upside down outside a building or jumping off bridges in handcuffs. Movies at the time were still silent. So to have a man who turns up in person, would speak to the crowd, build rapport and put on a show was incredible. He would be, would be put into the straight jacket, lie on the floor and be taken up into a crane in front of all these people he would do it outside newspaper offices, giving him free press. that They didn't even have to leave the building to write about it or take photos. He would perform on the street in front of anyone who was there free of charge. He would mingle with the crowd. He would talk to everyone. He was charming. He was smiley. He would use everyday objects that they would have themselves a packing case a milk can ropes from 
buildings he once used a crane that was being used to build a bridge so the crowd identified with him he was originally from Hungary he wasn't big he wasn't particularly strong he wasn't aloof and dashing like the the silent film stars maybe and he was doing all of these stunts for them so he was incredibly popular and his charm and his passion for his field meant that he was also incredibly popular with other people working in performance. Many believe that this competitive need for success was a desire to impress his mother and make her proud. And, and maybe in a way it was. He had many other siblings. He wanted to be top dog. But it's possible that once he'd hit the top of his game, he was just unable to allow himself to relinquish the spot, even if it meant being constantly at his physical and mental limit. In July 1912, he was locked into handcuffs and leg irons, nailed into a packing crate, which was then tied up with rope and weighed down with 200 pounds of lead and dropped into the East River. He had planned to do this from the pier, but the police forbade it, so he hired a tugboat, filled it with press and did it anyway. He escaped in 57 seconds, and when the crate was pulled to the surface, it was found to still be intact with the manacles inside. Houdini performed at least three variations on a buried alive stunt. The first in California in 1915 nearly killed him. Houdini was buried without a casket in a pit of earth six feet deep and became exhausted and panicked whilst trying to dig his way out, calling for help. And when his hand finally broke the surface, he fell unconscious and had to be pulled from the grave by his assistants. But rather than seeing this as a failure, this only added to his whole persona. He is willing to do things that will end in death. He wrote in his diary that the escape was very dangerous and that the weight of the earth is killing. Houdini's second variation on the Buried Alive was an endurance test designed to expose mystical Egyptian performer Raman Bey, who had claimed to use supernatural powers to remain in a sealed casket for an hour. Houdini loved to expose frauds. And on the 5th of August, 1926, he remained in a sealed coffin submerged in the swimming pool of a New York hotel for one and a half hours. Houdini claimed he did not want to use any trickery or supernatural powers to accomplish this feat. He just used controlled breathing and he repeated this feat at the YMCA in Worcester, Massachusetts on the 28th of September 1926, this time remaining sealed for one hour and 11 minutes. By his mid-30s, he was earning up to 5,000 US dollars a week. That's about $70,000 in today's money. But he wasn't a one-trick pony. Harry Houdini was the first person to fly a plane in Australia. He was passionate about, he learned to fly in 1909 and then was was obsessed with it. He starred in silent movies, which weren't a success. He didn't really like doing it. He said that the earnings were too meagre, which I think is a great insight into his personality. For many people, acting is an overpaid profession. But for Houdini, he can turn up anywhere on his own and draw a crowd and make huge amounts he doesn't have to wait for anyone else he's not beholden to anyone else and he does what he likes and what he's good at he's in control being on a film set for him must have been incredibly slow and boring when headlining the new york hippodrome he vanished a fully grown elephant from the stage i know that you like me will want to know she was called jenny Ever the showman and raconteur behind the scenes, Houdini was physically exhausted. In 1913, when he, his beloved mother died, he fainted on hearing the news. And though he was incredibly happily married to Bess, they were unable to have the children they both desperately wanted. And he would often perform in children's hospitals or to children's wards in hospitals. It was a great sadness to both of them, I think, that they couldn't have children 
he also became vaguely obsessed with the idea that you could sew monkey testicles onto your own testicles as a sort of youth elixir and was doing a lot of research into that I, I don't think he went through with it and he was larger than life until he wasn't many people think that Houdini died whilst performing a water tank trick this isn't the case accounts from eyewitnesses are slightly conflicting and obviously it's got uh changed over the years and his brother Dash who inherited all his equipment and papers and Bess were both sort of sworn to secrecy and sworn to burn everything after he died. So there's a little bit of doubt as to what happened. But from what we can tell, we're going, we're going to go on the story of the two, two of the three students who were present that day as they corroborated each other when they were interviewed later. But in October 1926, three student fans visit him backstage and one, Jocelyn Whitehead, asked if it was true that Houdini could really stand any punches to the stomach. Houdini said yes, and before he has a chance to brace himself, Whitehead delivered a series of heavy punches to Houdini's stomach. Now, at the time, Houdini was lying on a sofa because he'd recently broken his ankle, so he was keeping his foot up in between shows and hadn't been given time to brace for this attack so he gestured for Whitehead to stop saying he'd not been prepared and would have preferred to be standing and is clearly in some pain now that evening Houdini performs in great pain and over the next two days was unable to sleep and basically just remained in constant pain he refused to cancel shows or seek any medical help until Bess puts her foot down He's then found to have a temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's 39 degrees centigrade, and acute appendicitis. He's advised to have an immediate operation. He ignores this advice, despite having spoken to his own personal doctor, who also says, you need to go and have an immediate operation. And he goes on with the show. When he arrives at the Garrick Theatre in Detroit, Michigan on the 24th of October for what would be his last performance, he now has a fever of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 degrees Celsius. And despite this, he takes to the stage. It's reported that he passed out during the show, some say after the show, but is revived and continues to the end. And afterwards, he's hospitalized at Detroit's Grace Hospital. Here he undergoes emergency surgery but by the time they operate it's too late. His appendix has burst and he is suffering from peritonitis. At the time before antibiotics peritonitis was incurable. It's pretty unpleasant now. It was incurable and nasty then and there's nothing they can do. After two weeks, he says to Bess, I'm tired of fighting, and dies on the 31st of October 1926. His funeral takes place on the 4th of November with over 2,000 people present. Now there's loads of speculation about whether the dressing room incident caused Houdini's eventual death. That poor guy is a bit like Danny Baker and Bob Marley's toe. Uh, I feel very sorry for the guy who, who punched Houdini. The relationship between blunt force trauma and appendicitis is there there basically it is very unlikely that trauma uh, blunt force can cause appendicitis but it's not completely to be ruled out and one theory suggests that Houdini was unaware that he also had the early signs of appendicitis and might have become aware had the punching not taken place and when the pain got worse he just assumed it was damage from the punching rather than something sinister whether i mean he gets told quite early on that it's appendicitis and chooses not to have the operation so whether the outcome would have been any different seems unlikely for me, it all seems to be a bit coincidental. You get a hit in the stomach and then your appendix of a, a, a ruptures. I wonder if it was just that at the particular angle at which he was sitting, coupled with the fact that 
all accounts say they were really hard hits. Whether, unfortunately, those two combined are the exception that proves, proves the rule about blunt trauma and appendicitis. But I'm no doctor. Now, Houdini and Bess had agreed that when he died, if possible, he would communicate with her from beyond using their secret code, which was the name of their favourite film. Houdini spent his life debunking mediums and seances and all of that. So I love the fact that even after death, he was practically going to be putting this to the test. And so every year on Halloween, the day of his death, Bess would hold a seance to try and communicate with him. It was never successful. And after 10 years, she gives up saying 10 years is long enough to wait around for any man. Magicians across the world still hold seances to contact Houdini on Halloween. It's become a bit of a magician's tradition. And on that day in 1975, he was given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And that is the story of arguably the first celebrity, Harry Houdini. I hope you enjoyed that story. We'll probably be on to something a bit dark next week to counterbalance it. You know I'm all about the balance. I hope you're cuddled in well. It's got proper cold here. I'm sitting in front of the fire. I love to hear from you. So I really want to know about your recommendations for episodes. So you can email me at the Monday Night Review at gmail.com. If you're a Patreon, you can message me on there and get my eternal love. I love Patreons. Um, if you want to join up, you can go to patreon.com slash the Monday Night Review and listen to every episode ad free, get mini sodes and extra stories. And um, I'm trying to do some hardcore pre recording for the Christmas season, hopefully. So anything that you would like to hear, please let me know. You can also come find me on social media at the Monday Night Review on Instagram. Facebook and TikTok. And until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive. <laughs>